You know what you're looking for, don't you? It's in a it's in a small box. It's a flowered box. It's on the left hand side. Uh, right just to the left here, she said. It's about the size of a shoe box. It's all kind of colored box. About the size of a shoe box. Do you see it? Just a moment, dear. box. That just looks like it. I've got it, I think. Bring it on down. What's this for anyway? Well, look at it and see. Pictures when we were dating. Yes. Wow. And uh, some of the love letters, too. Our granddaughter called a little bit ago and wanted to know what it's like being in love. So I thought I'd show her these pictures and these letters. I think a boy likes her. A boy? You were a boy once, and you really liked a girl. Remember? I can't believe you kept all these letters all this time. Why did you do it? Because one day I knew our granddaughter would ask me about falling in love. Remember some of these pictures here? Yes, wow. this is taken at yeah. my mother's house. Right. You never know what you'll find in the attic. You never know whether you'll find a treasure or a skeleton. People find all kinds of things in the attic. In fact, in recent years, there has been a renewed interest in such matters, so much so that a new television show entitled Treasure Detectives has coined a new phrase called barn finds. Barn finds, they say, in the barns across this country, or the closets, or the cellars, or the attics, all kinds of treasures and skeletons are found. Listen to Curtis Dowling, the host of this new reality TV series, who says, the amazing things a thing about barn finds is that they happen every day. You'd think that after all these years, no one would have anything left. But if you thought that, you'd be wrong. So I went online and clicked on a site dedicated to barn finds, and this is a quote from that site. Collectibles with unbelievably high values can be stashed almost anywhere. So, take heed. If you don't use or sell off your valuables, your descendants will. And if you ever have to clean out a relative's house, always check the attic. Items that might not look like much can be pay dirt. Kind of leaves you wondering what it is that people f find in their attics, doesn't it? So I did a little checking, and I found some interesting things. I found that Carl Kissner of Defiance, Ohio, made an interesting discovery up in the attic, cleaning out things from either his parents or his grandparents. And while he was cleaning things out, he found a box. And in that box, once he had opened it, he found baseball cards, many baseball cards mint condition baseball cards. 
And as he rifled through the baseball card collection and county, he discovered that there were 700 baseball cards. Well, this has to have some value, he thought, so he took it to an antique sports dealer and asked him, would you look at these? Do these have any value at all? Well, after looking at them carefully, after taking his time to assess what was there, the man came back to Kistner and said, let me give you my conservative estimate. My conservative estimate is that this baseball card collection is worth $3 million. Right there in the attic. People find amazing things in their attics. Take, for example, the brother and sister. They were doing the cleaning. It was a sad moment in their life. Mom and dad had got, both gone to their rest. And now it was time to clean out the old family house. They had finally made it up to the attic, to the spider webs, to the dust, to everything that is in the attic. The attic didn't look like that one. They were up there cleaning it all out. They lived in West London, not too far from Heathrow Airport. As they were doing their cleaning, they came upon what looked to be Chinese antiquities. These were things that were clearly from China. They figured that out, but they didn't know where they came from, why their parents had them or exactly what they were. After some consultation, they decided, well we'll, well, we'll take them to one of the auction houses in London. So they went to the Bainbridge Auction House, took these items and said, can you value these and then auction them off? So Bainbridge did that. All those many antiquities went for different prices, some as low as $65 a piece. But there was one discovery that they had made. It was a 16-inch vase. It was a beautiful vase. It was well-crafted. The painting was intricately done. They determined that it was from the Qing dynasty. This would have some value. And so finally, the day came for the auction, and the vase went on auction. The bidding began. The bidding began at $800,000. They set back and took it all in. The bidding only lasted for a half an hour. A half an hour later, the final bid came in. The gavel went down, sold to somebody who wasn't even present, somebody who had called in on the phone from China, but had made the bid that won the day and thus purchased the Chinese antiquity that has been sold for the largest sum in history, $69.5 million dollars million dollars, 69.5 million, right there in the attic. So we're going to stand and have the benediction and race home to the attic. <laughs> what do I have in my attic? I got to find out what's up there. But before you race away too quickly, I ought to add one other piece. Not everything you find in the attic is good. Sometimes when you get to rummaging around in the attic, you find some skeletons, skeletons that you might not even have known were there. Such was the, the case of Stefan Gabe. Stefan Gabe, it wasn't his attic he was cleaning out. It was the attic of a friend, a retired tax collector. And as he, as he was going through all of the different items there in that attic, Stefan Gabe made a discovery. He made the discovery of a head, a human head, a skull to be precise. I don't know if it was opening a box or what it was, but he reached down in there and pulled it out, and it wasn't the entire skeleton, but it was the head. <laughs> Ooh, that's scary, like looking in a mirror. <laughs> this head, he was very curious, how did this get here? What exactly is this? So he pulls some scientists in, and they begin to study this skull. There are still some questions that remain, but there is almost unanimity on this, that that skull that Gabe found in the attic is the skull of none other than King Henry IV of France. Henry IV of France, who died in 1610, in the attic. You want to know how it got there? Go home and Google it. Story's too long. <laughs> but there it was in the attic. So you can't count on the fact that everything in you that you find in the attic will be good or of value. Some will be painful. Some will be surprising. 
Now, clearly, the attic of our lives is representative of our family's history, our family legacy, the heritage that our family has left us, the heritage of generations, maybe. So when you go up and begin to rustle around in the attic, you may find that there are some very good things there, some positive stories, stories of people who stood for right, stories of people who placed family first, stories of people who made a difference in other people's lives, stories of people whose choices have improved your life. If you go through your family's history, if you are cleaning out your attic and that's what you find, I think the response is immediate and automatic. You, if you can, still do so, find the people involved. You place a phone call. You send an email. You write a letter. You plan a trip, and you go, and you see these people. You talk to these people, and you say to them, I just have to give you my deepest, my most heartfelt gratitude for what you did in our family. The positive echoes of the choices you made continue to reverberate in my life. If you find good things in the attic, you need to say thank you. You need to express that gratitude. But what if the things aren't so good? What if the things you find up there are skeletons that you wish weren't there, that you wish were not a part of your family legacy? After all, we know enough from studying families today that we recognize that patterns repeat in families, generation after generation, sometimes of very painful things, addictions, alcoholism, drug abuse, repeated in generations, abuse, somebody bawling up their fist and hitting somebody else. It tends to repeat in families. Affairs, broken homes, sadness and sorrow, anger run amok. Those are the kinds of things you might find in your family attic, which you will say, I wish this weren't here. But now that I know it is, what do I do about it? Well, I want to take us to the book of Genesis for a suggestion of what we might wish to do if we find such things in the attic. Now, allow me to set the table before we eat the meal so that we know what we're looking at in the book of Genesis. The book of, of Genesis really consists of two great fours. Two great fours. The first is four great events. The second is four great people. The first appears in the first part of Genesis. The, the other appears in the rest of Genesis. So the first four is four great events. Creation, fall, flood, nations. Nations happens at the Tower of Babel. That's the first part of Genesis, the four great events. But the rest of Genesis, four great people, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. The rest of Genesis tells a four-generation story of one family. Now, here's what I wonder. Suppose we had waited till the fourth generation of that family. Suppose we had waited until Joseph came along. And then with Joseph, we climbed up the crickety stairs into the attic, and we began to rummage around. What would we have found in the attic of Abraham's family? Well, you already have a pretty good idea from the Scripture reading that was read this morning. You know that over those four generations, there was a repeating family theme. Generation number one, Abraham. Abraham and Sarah. Abraham and Sarah move southward to Egypt to escape the effects of a famine. And when they do so, Abraham gets to looking at Sarah, and he says, my goodness, you're easy on the eyes. You're so easy on the eyes, you're a threat. We get down there, those Egyptian men are going to start looking at you, and then they're going to start looking at me out of the corner of their eyes, and things aren't going to go well from there on out. So do me a favor. Lie to them. Tell them we're brother and sister. And she says, okay. Isn't that the way those family dysfunctions often occur? First of all, they start in fear. Fear. They're going to do something to me, so you take care of them. And then secondly, the dysfunction that we have is felt by others in the family. 
And that's precisely what happens. And they live that lie until discovered. But Abraham doesn't learn his lesson. Because just a few years later, now he is in Gerar. He finds Abimelech, the king of Gerar, in the Negev desert. And again, he talks to Sarah and says, we got to come to this agreement. Only this time, Abraham himself steps up and tells the lie. She's not my wife. She's my sister. And they live the lie until caught. We would find that in Joseph's attic. Move to the second generation. The generation of Isaac. Isaac and Rebekah married. Well, Isaac has learned from the best. He's learned from his father so that when his beautiful wife now becomes a danger, he says to her, you know, when they get to ask him about this, tell him, you're my sister. Let's be agreed on that. Okay? All right, she says. And so now she lies, and now they live the lie until caught. We would find that in Joseph's attic. Third generation. Now we're down to Jacob and Esau. They have no doubt heard the stories of the family. They are no doubt part of the family's emotional process. Now, they know as parents about Jacob and Esau. Rebecca knows because she has been told before the birth that the older would serve the younger. Well, the younger's her favorite, and that's not happening. So she concocts a scheme and pulls Jacob in on it and says, this is what we've got to do to make sure God's word is fulfilled in our family. And they come up with a scheme to deceive her husband, his father, that works remarkably well. But it causes an explosion in the family. It is a murderous lie that ends with Jacob fleeing for his life. He's learned well. That's the way this family works. Lie, 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 lie. Third generation, that's in Joseph's attic. But now we come to Joseph's generation. Now it's Joseph and his brothers. Joseph, the favored one. Joseph, the object of jealousy from the other brothers in the family. And they concoct a scheme. We'll grab him. Beat him, imprison him, sell him, and lie about it. And that is precisely what they do. By the time the day ends, Joseph is on his way to Egypt as a slave, and they are dipping his coat of many colors into the blood of a slain animal. They will take this home and present it to Father Jacob and say to him, He died. Look, an animal must have eaten him. And in a pre-DNA testing world, how is he to know? That's precisely what occurs. Another lie. More pain. More echoing of family patterns. But Joseph, that's a riches to rags to riches tale. You know how it unfolds. You know that he will finally rise in Egypt to the second in command to prime minister. You know that his brothers will come and bow before him pleading for food. And you know that he will reveal himself to them. They will stagger back in utter astonishment. But you also know that he issues forgiveness. Once he has made certain that they are changed men, he holds no grudge and he sets them free. And that's where we join the tale. All of this is in Joseph's attic. The question is, What will happen from this point forward? I want to read you a passage in Genesis. It's in the last chapter, chapter 50 of Genesis, but I want you to know the context before we read it. What is happening at this point in Genesis is that Father Jacob has died. Joseph, now prime minister of Egypt, is going to have to tend to the burial details. But as soon as the father dies, the other brothers now are once again stricken with absolute terror. The moment has come, they say. Now he can strike back at us. Now he's going to be able to get his revenge to have his vendetta play out. That's the way it works in this family. You remember that at one point in time, Esau, when he was going to go after Isaac, said, I'll wait. I'll wait until dad is dead. But once he's dead, I'm taking him out. No wonder they thought, now that our father is dead, Joseph will get his pound of flesh. 
In fact, they are so frightened, so utterly disturbed by what is going on that they can't even face him themselves. They send a messenger, an emissary, to talk to him. Listen to what happens next. Genesis chapter 50. I begin reading in verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph holds a grudge against us and pays us back for all the wrongs we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph saying, Your father, interesting wording, Your father left these instructions before he died. This is what you are to say to Joseph. I ask you to forgive your brothers the sins and the wrongs they committed in treating you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of the God of your father. When their message came to him, Joseph wept. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me. But God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. Now we could zero in on a number of different facets of that passage. We could talk about forgiveness. We could talk about divine providence. We could talk about the working of a good God in an evil world. All of those we could focus on with profit. But none of those are my focus today. Brother, I want to focus on another reality. If you follow the trajectory, if you follow the patterns of this family, you can understand the brother's fear. You can understand that they are saying among themselves, you know back then when he let us off the hook, when we were assured that all was forgiven, he was probably lying. That's what everybody in this family does. He's probably lying, just biding his time, waiting for his moment. We can't trust him. But what they didn't realize is that Joseph was a transitional person. Transitional person. I want to read you just two brief paragraphs from the late Dennis Guernsey describing transitions and transitional people, especially in family context. Guernsey wrote, A transition is defined as passing from one condition to another. In grammar, the effective use of transitions aids the reader and helps him or her follow the writer's ideas and or logic. In life, transitional people stand, as it were, on a bridge between two markedly different patterns of behavior or systems of relationships. So what Guernsey is saying is, if you're talking about a transitional person, a transitional person is the one who stands here, the bridge between all those family patterns of the past and all that we hope to have come in the future. That's a transitional person. Second paragraph from Guernsey. Transitional people decide that the dysfunction of the past, especially that which is transmitted through generations, stops with them. They dig their heels in and refuse to pass the craziness on to their children. Most often they have grown weary of the struggle and pain of their lives and have decided not to inflict that pain on those they love. For Joseph, it was a family who depended on lying to survive. For you, it may be different. It may be a family where anger erupted regularly and violently. It may be a family where abuse was present. It may be a family where promises were regularly broken, where vows did not stand. It may be a family where, who knows, the bottles were hidden and stashed around the house. I don't know, but if you start rummaging through the attic, you will find things, maybe some good things for which you can be grateful, but maybe some things that you say, oh my goodness, my family, and I can already see the beginnings of that in my generation. Joseph had ample reason for that, looking back through his family's history, so that when a moment in time came where his brothers had reason to mistrust him, 
to think that he too had lied to them. He stepped into that gap and he said, no, by the grace of the God who has worked the evil into good in my life, I have made the difficult decision to be a transitional person. I will no longer seek revenge, turn to treachery, or lie about reality. When I said I forgave you, that's exactly what I did. So that you have spent all these years living with a fear that has no basis. That is a transitional person. Somebody who looks back over all the pain of the past and says, by the mercy, by the goodness, by the grace of a God who can bring good out of bad, it stops here. It goes no further. I will not, as Guernsey said, pass the craziness on to my kids. My question as we're in the attic this morning is, do you, do you wish, do you choose to be a transitional person? I'm going to assume that for many of you the answer is yes. But that is immediately followed by another question, and that is how? How can I be that? How can I do what Joseph did? Before I leave the attic today, I want to know the how. Well, let me share just a brief thought that has been very helpful to me over the years. First came to me maybe two and a half decades ago, seated in the office of a counselor, rummaging through my own attic. I can't tell you the precise words he used, but I think they were close to these. But I can tell you that they have followed me in positive ways over the years. And here's the thought. Until I understand and know what it is that I'm doing, I have no choice but to continue doing it. Until I understand and know what it is that I'm doing, I have no choice but to continue doing it. What does that mean? Well, it means this. Suppose I decide that I'm going to take up and get good at the game of golf. Now, to say that I'm not good at golf is a vast understatement, but suppose I'm going to decide I'm going to get good at golf. And so I, I go out to the driving range here in Loma Linda, Barton Road, and I rent some clubs and some balls, and I start that process over and over again. I'm hitting the balls, ball after ball, hitting it. Some, by some stroke of luck, go straight down the fairway. Most of them slicing off this way, hooked off that way, people diving for cover. I'm just, but I'm practicing, I'm determined. I keep going after it. Day after day, I'm out there hitting ball after ball after ball. One day, a golf pro happens by, and he stands there and he watches this, this spectacle. He watches what's happening here. And he has a tender heart. So when I'm done and exhausted, he comes over and taps me on the shoulder and says, you know, I think I could help you. Well, that happens to be a good day for me, and I'm able to swallow my pride. And I say, really? He says, yes. I say, all right, I'm willing to try. He says, all right, meet me here tomorrow. I meet him there the next day, and we go out there. He lines me up and says, okay, I want you to drive some balls. And I'm going to just stand right over here, and I'm going to record this for posterity. I'm going to record this. I say, okay. And so he records me driving those balls here, there, and everywhere. And then he says, when we're, when we're done, he says, okay, now I want, you, I want to show you what you've been doing. And so we get, go in and we sit down in front of a large, unfortunately, HD screen. And we watch what happens. And he starts pointing things out. He says, look here, what you're doing with your hips. What you're doing with your arms here and your head, you see how it's coming up? Watch your back swing. He starts describing some of the things that I was unaware of. And then he says, now I want to show you something else. And now he puts in a different DVD. In a rather humble stroke, he puts a DVD of himself in. And he says, now I want you to watch this. And I see him swinging and connecting and the ball disappearing every time. But he says, don't watch the ball. Watch this. Watch my hips, my arms, my head. He says, that's how you need to do it. And a whole new world of options opens before me. Once I understand what it is that I'm doing wrong, once I understand what it is to do that is right, 
I have new options. Until I understand that, make no mistake about it, practice does not make perfect. Practice makes permanent. So I can drive balls all day long, and I will never rise beyond a certain limit if I don't understand good technique. It is no different in the family. The family patterns hand down over generation after generation will be the easiest ruts into which you will fall. You will have to make the decision. Am I willing to go into the attic and do some discovery? If you are, I suggest three steps, three factors, three elements to that. First one is when you go up in your attic, you've got to find out what's there. You just have to assess what's there. That's called hindsight. You're taking a look back. What was in my family? What are the patterns? What is the legacy? That's hindsight. This is what is here in the attic. Second step is making some judgments about that. That's insight. Now, once you have the facts before you, now you have to make judgments. Is this positive? Is this negative? And, and, and what does it lead to? How does it affect people in the family? Two steps, hindsight, insight. Third step, foresight. Now your question is, what do I do about this from this point forward? What are the possibilities? What change can result as I seek to become a transitional person? I would suggest to you that while the terminology would have been very different, that all three of those steps were a part of the life of a man named Joseph. Why do I say that? Because how else could he come to a moment in time when he could have his revenge? And instead of taking that, he could say, you intended it to me for evil. God used it for good. That is spoken by someone who has hindsight, who has insight, who has foresight. And so if you have the courage to climb the rickety stairs into the attic, to know something about your family, I hope you find good. I hope you find a Qing Dynasty vase. And when you do, don't forget who encouraged you to go to the attic. <laughs> but I also know that you may discover something else. When you do, Pray and ask that the God of Joseph would enter into your life, giving you the wisdom and the courage, the hindsight, the insight, the foresight to be a transitional person. Do you know one of the key ways I know Joseph was a transitional person? It is because of the last statement, the final statement that is made about his interactions with his brothers. It's the last part of verse 21 of chapter 50 of Genesis. Here is what the epitaph of his relationship to his brothers is. It says this, And Joseph reassured them and spoke kindly to them. You wouldn't expect that from this family. But somehow God, while he was in the dungeon or the attic, made a difference in his life, in his family and he can do so in yours. So I guess my question is, are you ready by the grace of God to enter your attic? Mm -hmm.